my story begins in Manila 20 years ago. I was in Manila um, on a very rainy night. I was there as a management consultant. I was with one of the leading firms, and I was working on a project for Caltech's oil company. Um, Caltex was in the middle of sort of the best of times and the worst of times. The good news was that as the economies of East Asia had been growing, finally automobiles were affordable to the middle class and demand for uh, retail gasoline was exploding. Um, the bad news was that Caltex was investing very hard trying to gain share in this very attractive environment, and they were up against a number of the other largest companies in the world, the other major oil companies, and what Caltex and their owners believed was that they were losing share, despite the fact that they were investing millions and millions of dollars in attempting to grow it, and as they measured the returns on their investment, they were seeing very um, unacceptable results. And so they asked me and my team to come in and try to understand where were the opportunities for Caltex to improve? Understand what was the impact of all the new uh, stations they were building, understand the training programs, the advertising, adding C stores and so forth. So it was raining like crazy. And after a hard day of management consulting, I was sitting with uh, the chairman of Caltex Oil Philippines named, uh, uh, named Bill Tiffany, and we were having a couple of glasses of sparkling water. Um, and Bill said to me, you know, it rains like this about 130 days a year here. And I had an idea, which is that I've built canopies on some of our gas stations. My idea is that when it's raining like this, people can see that jeepney driver, he can be underneath the canopy and stay, stay dry uh, when they pump their gas. Now, the jeepney driver didn't really get the idea, but you understand what I'm talking about. He said, can you model that for me and help me understand whether or not these canopies work? So I went back to the team, and we talked about how we might build a model to understand the impact of these canopy investments. Um, consultants have interesting images of themselves. Their clients have interesting images of management consultants. Um, and I think at the time, there was a divided view among the Caltex folks as to just how good we really were. Uh, some of them had the impression that modeling was magic. Um, and they had seen some of the rhetoric um, that surrounded our work. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at the description, self-description of modelers um, in the industry on the internet, you find a consistent phrase that shows up time after time after time. And it's, it's really pretty interesting. It's a phrase, modeling art and science. And I think the question I want to talk about today a little bit is, I get it that decision analytics is a science, but how is it an art? Why don't we explore that for just a second together? Um, this is also from the internet, where the art and science is broken out and it's described that the art is the modeling of the data. Um, I want to show you a model I built. This is a model of US retail sales from 1992 to 2006, trying to address the question, what impact did advertising have on sales? Um, and to get to that question, I bring into my model a wide variety of um, macroeconomic factors, gross domestic product, unemployment, lending rate, and so forth. And I also add in advertising spend. And I've used here multilinear regression to estimate the impact of each one of these factors on the, the variable here, which is US retail sales. And I've actually come up with a model that explains 99.8% of the difference between the points. Very successful. So that's great. Um, I will now confess to you that I've told you a small lie because there's not one model here, there's actually two. And what I've done as the modeler, sorry, I will tell you also that it explains 2007 great. What I've done as a modeler is I have the ability, the latitude, to select whatever variables I want. And in model one, I've selected changes in gross domestic product, changes in unemployment, changes in lending rate, changes in advertising. Uh, as GDP goes up, sales go up. As unemployment goes up, sales go down. That's an unfavorable variable and so forth. And here we have a model that uh, has a 99.8% R square. And of course, advertising is contributing to the growth of retail sales. Great. Here's model two. I've choos chosen some other variables, consumer sentiment, total income, imports, household debt, and so forth. And in this particular model, which also explains 99.8% of the difference, advertising is actually unfavorable. 
This model would purport that spending money on advertising makes sales go down. And so part of the art here, sometimes it's the art of self-preservation, is determining which combination of these variables actually to one's own impressions uh, is, describing the, uh, is describing the outcome the best. And so of course here, under the art of self-preservation, I'm not gonna stand in front of a management team and say that uh, all of your advertising has been destroying sales, so uh, here's my model. Um, advertising is good and away we go. Now, in 2008, the modeling industry, especially as it relates to advertising in the United States, uh, hit a very bad rut in the road. When the Great Recession hit, all of the models that the modelers had purported to the buyers had been explaining the impact of advertising at a very terrific level of precision went wrong. And the, uh, the buyers of those models demanded to understand why they should buy them anymore. Uh, in the meantime, back in the Philippines, we're running these models on, um, on a canopy investment. And true to form, we could prove that the canopies were great, that the canopies had no impact, or the canopies were actually harming sales. And we thought maybe there's a better way. Well, taking a look at, uh, I'm sorry, I want to pause on this for one second. We may come back to this in Q&A. Um, Multilinear regression is the substitution of a correlation coefficient for knowledge of the mechanism of change. And what we aspire to in our analytics is an understanding of the mechanism of change. Now, back in the Philippines, uh, we thought, well, maybe we can just look at what was happening to these stations where we put in the, uh, where we put in the, uh, the canopies. And in a very painstaking way, we took the sales of every single one of those uh, every single one of those stores over time. We lined them all up so that the same time zero was the time at which these uh, canopies were put in, and we had a look. And we see that before the canopies were installed, well, as I said, demand was going up, and indeed sales were going up, and after the canopies were installed, sales were going up, and it was pretty darn hard to conclude anything looking only at the performance of the stores that had the canopies installed with regard to the attributable uh, value of the investment in the canopies. So far so good? Great. So what we ultimately did was we employed the scientific method. We took those same stories that we just saw, we lined them all up on T0, and we measured the change in performance from the time before the canopies were installed to the times after they were installed. And we found in the rest of the network a bunch of other locations that were just as like those test stores in every way we possibly could, with one exception, that is, they didn't get the canopy. And in a term of art, we were measuring pre versus post, test versus control. The scientific method. This, I will, uh, I will uh, state to you, is the gold standard of analytics. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about how we can apply that in our businesses. Um, so away we went. We had the, uh, the canopy group. We had the match control group. Uh, we took a look at what happened pre, what happened post. We lined them all up, and oh wow, what kind of fantastic animation is that? There was a lift, and the lift was significant, and the lift in dollars and cents terms was fantastic. Basically, these canopies were paying back in about three months. Terrific return on investment, great move by Bill. And Bill said to us when we presented this material, and he did not go to charm school. This guy was an oil man. He didn't particularly like the fact that he had consultants there telling him how to run his business. He said, that's the best analysis I ever saw. And before we had the chance to totally revel in his compliment, he said, no, by the way, can you please tell me a couple of other things? Because now that you've told me that it works, I'd really like to know, when the lift, when these stores went up, was it taking sales from my other locations? And was the investment, I put some of these in Metro Manila and some of them up country, did it work better in one place or the other? I had two versions. One was higher for trucks, one wasn't. Did one do better than the other? Um, what happened to the transactions at the stores and so forth and so on. Each of these, I will tell you, are totally valid questions as we try to make a decision of what we're gonna do with our investment dollars. Went back to the team, said the boss loved it, fantastic. And we then spent two full weeks by hand working through this data um, to answer each one of these questions. And by the time we were done, well, Bill had already decided to roll the program out um, because we couldn't quite keep up with the 
with the pace of decisions. But we learned something that day, which was the power of the application of the scientific methods and the physical channels, and we built a consulting business around it. We served pub chains in UK. We served branch banks in the United States. We served um, drugstore chains in Australia. And in every case, A, the client loved it. B, I was wiping out my case seams. It was so hard, so complicated, so time consuming that we decided, you know what, we probably ought to uh, build a software company out of this, which is what we did. And from that uh, night in Manila in 1997 till today, we now serve hundreds of companies all over the world with a software that helps support this process. We've got offices in six continents. And to top it all off, one of the better days of my professional life, we were acquired by MasterCard about, about two years ago. So what I told my guys I wanted to do, my team, was, a, oh, I beg your pardon. And let me just pause for one second. Um, this approach is applicable to a wide variety of industries, and one of the most important ones that we serve is financial services. And the kinds of issues that are addressed with this technology include kind of the eternal verities of business, pricing. How do I acquire customers? How do I build my relationship? How do I retain them? Promotions, digital strategy, network strategy, relationship management, and so forth. The kinds of questions that gnaw at us at all times are being addressed by our financial services clientele using this approach. So I wanted to come and tell you about it. Um, and I had uh, my original title for this presentation was Improving Process Using Business Experimentation. And one of my guys said, Scott, you can't do it. And I said, why not? And he said, because, don't you know, everybody's already doing testing themselves. This is going to be put in their feet to sleep. Um, and I accept that. We talked to a lot of companies. We went into a lot of companies that are doing this by themselves, doing it by hand. Um, and I know their pain. We heard earlier about the Gardner uh, uh, hype curve and the, the peak of unrealistic expectations. There's also the valley of despair. And time after time, I meet with companies that are trying to do this themselves by hand um, and are running into real problems. Example number one is they just don't believe the results. Um, in about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, uh, I met with the Gap, you know, the Gap, the retail chain. They're head of testing. Uh, they're located in a cool, gray city of love. And she told me that in the last 12 months, the Gap had run a total of 60 tests. And they had acted on the results of zero of them. And I, I said, well, you know, why not? <laughs> and she said, well, you know, problem one was, I was, I'm really not quite so sure I believe the answers. We had one test, and the, the, the purported outcome, purported finding, was that if I reduce inventory, I will improve my returns, and oh, by the way, sales, sales don't change at all. That test had been run by the head of inventory efficiency. And there was another test that had been run, and the results were that YouTube advertising is better than TV advertising. And that test had been run by the head of digital advertising. And there was another test that had been run, and the results were that the blue sweaters should be in the front of the store. And that test was run by the head of blue sweaters merchandise. We said, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we decided at least to ask them, how did you do these tests? And we got, you know, some answers that didn't really give us full confidence that we were getting what we wanted. Uh, which locations did you choose for your test group? Well, I, I, I don't know. I chose five stores right nearby. I chose the five stores I thought it would work the best in. I stored all the stores in the, city of, in, the, uh, in the state of Michigan. How long did the test run? One week, three weeks, five weeks. Did you see how the results changed over time? Oh my God, no, it's just so hard to get the answer. Isn't that the answer, isn't that good enough? What control group did you use? Well, for every store, I used another store in the network, just like it. For the stores in San Francisco, I used all the stores in Santa Barbara. For the stores in my test, I used the entire rest of the country as my control group. Um, did you also measure online in your, oh man, really? So hard. Um, are these results statistically significant? You know, what's that? Um, so problem number one is the problem of inconsistency of implementation that leads to lack of credibility in the results. Problem number two is actually a little more common in more sophisticated companies. And I would say the financial services country, companies are among the most sophisticated um, in this area. Uh, this is an example from a North American financial services company that tested a new sales an insurance company, a new sales program that was basically focused on expanding the uh, capability of uh, the agent team. There was training, there was support, there were incentives. This was going to cost $50 million to roll out. And they ran a test with a bunch of agents. And the marketing team evaluated the test and they measured pre versus post test versus control, a 5% percent 
net lift in premiums, which constituted a 14% return on investment, an over hurdle return. The finance team measured the exact same program. They measured a lift of less than 1%, which given the investment constituted a negative return. And it is not unusual that the marketing team likes things more than the finance team, but here we have two competing analytic teams looking at the exact same activity and coming up with completely different solutions. And when you look at the assumptions they were making, it's not that big a deal. They were using the exact same test group. Um, the marketing team was using a six-month pre-period. The finance team was using a one-year pre-period. The marketing team for a control group was using all the non-test reps from similar markets to the markets where the test was run. The finance team was basically choosing all similar non-test reps from the rest of the country. And just from those small differences, they were coming to 180 degree different conclusions. And they're both reasonable ways to look at it. Who's right, right? Um, what's going on at the base of all this is the essential problem in applying the scientific method in the physical channels. We are basically dealing with a very radical form of the signal to noise problem. We are trying to measure valuable changes in performance. In our performance metrics, oftentimes a test that drives a 2% lift is really valuable. In a world where results oftentimes go up and down by tens or hundreds of percent a day by location. So I thought I'd come and tell you a little bit about uh, two dimensions of cracking a code. It's a much bigger topic than I can cover in the amount of time I've got here, but I do want to at least scratch the surface of a couple of areas where um, as you move forward with your enterprise, you might be able to make some progress. Um, the first is in test design. Um, and the first within test design is dimensioning the test. The questionnaire is how many test subjects do I need so that when I get a result, it is statistically significant. Why does it matter? Well, if I underdimension a test, if I've chosen too few test subjects, if I run the test in too short a time period, I run the bigger risk. I'm committing a bigger crime, and that is the risk of unintentionally confusing signal for noise. If I don't have enough test subjects, noise can overcome the signal I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to detect. Um, the second the second problem is uh, not as bad a crime, but in some pl places it's, it's equally unforgivable, and that is that I spent too much money on a test. I had too many test subjects. It went too long. Um, I, I've, spent, uh, I've spent too much. Now, the solution to this is actually a math problem. It has to do, and I'm talking to a little jargon here, it has to do with the underlying variance of the metric under study. How much does the metric go up and down when I'm not doing anything to it? If it goes up and down a lot, I need a lot of test subjects. If it doesn't go up and down very much, relatively speaking, I need fewer. What is the degree of precision I'm looking for in my test? If I'm looking for a gross change, typically I need fewer observations. If I'm looking for a very fine grain change, I need more. And what is the degree of statistical significance I will accept when I see a difference between test and control? We aim for 95% statistical certainty as sort of our, our benchmark threshold. And what you can do is basically develop the heuristics that allow you for any given test. This is one that's being run at a postal code level. Um, and the objective is to be able to read a 2% change um, at a 95% degree of statistical significance. To do that, I need, I think this is animated, look at that, I need 250 test zips. And if I'm looking for a 3% lift, actually I only need 150. And if I'm looking for a 1%, I need, I need even more. Um, very important that one is able to answer that question going in um, uh, to be able to assure your team that uh, uh, your results are valid. Second, it sounds commonsensical, but it's, it's surprising how often this misses, making sure that the test group is representative of the rollout population. Sometimes good men and good women of goodwill try an idea where they think it's going to work the best, on the customers it's going to work the best, on and so forth. Um, the important thing in going through this process is being able to take the results and apply them to a larger population. Um, so therefore, you want to make sure that the test group matches the distribution of key attributes of that rollout population. And the attributes, it depends, and, and there's a, a wide range of different ways you can think about this. Oftentimes, there are both um, kind of activity CRM uh, type 
measures within your, uh, within your customer database, also other demographic ones. Um, but what you're looking for is not to have this happen. You, these is, this is the test group, this is the control group, this is income. You don't want to run a test where, for example, uh, you have uh, basically a test group that has significantly lower income than a rollout population. And in the uh, second example here, uh, we don't want to run a test that's biased towards people that are getting lots more offers than, uh, than the rest of our population. You want to uh, make sure that those are well matched. The third, and um, I'd love to come back and do two hours on this, is control group creation methodology. Um, I, I made a deal in Japan with a company, um, and they were ready to kick off, and they wanted actually the kickoff meeting to be with the chief marketing officer. And they had sent us their data, and we started loading it into our software, but it just, just didn't feel right. Um, I was told, this is a kickoff meeting. The CMO's very enthusiastic. Off we go. But I wasn't so sure. We didn't, as I say, have a signed contract. And um, in any event, I got there, started through the presentation, and it became very obvious to me very, very quickly that this was not a sold deal yet, and it was going to depend on how this meeting went. So we came to control group. And I said, you know, this is where we can really help you. There's one area we can really help a lot, because I know how you do tests today. You basically measure the results of test stores, there it is, as compared to the same stores last year, year-over-year -year comps is what it's called. And I said, what we went back and did is we took that methodology and we looked at it during a period when you weren't running any tests, you were just treating them the same. And we indexed those two together, and what do we get? That. This is basically the test versus control in a six-month period when I was treating both of these populations, or rather the stories over the six-month period before and after the same. And basically what I see is that on an average week, results were going up and down 6.2%. And, oh, by the way, there was an underlying bias. There was a growth of these uh, stories as time went on, uh, greater than 3%, which means that if I then run my test and I see a 4% lift, I'm not so sure that it really came from the test and not just its underlying bias. He said, yeah, I get that. That's pretty smart. Well, what if I just compare them to all the other stores of the network and just by complete luck, I happen to have that in the deck. And I said, yeah, we look at that. And actually, uh, you get the opposite. Um, here, you, you cut the noise in about half, but now you have a negative slope, still not acceptable. And he said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, there are lots of ways you can create a control group. We went through a number of them. And the one that we, uh, we landed on was for each individual test location, we found another group of locations that are just like it. And when we do that, we basically eliminate both noise and bias. And he said, OK, we'll do the project. And they've been clients of ours now for over five years. Um, working now to that issue that we had with the financial services company of, I've got all these different components. And unless I have the one that works best, I won't be able to resolve. Um, there's a methodology we use where we basically take a group of assumptions and run quote unquote null tests. We are looking at observations of thousands of different time periods. Um, when we are treating a test group and a control group the same, we're basically applying these different principles to the test. And the question is, when we're treating them both the same, how different do they operate? And it creates a distribution of error and you can then take strategy one, take strategy two, you get a different distribution of error. This one I believe is better. And ultimately what you're looking for is the combination of inputs that drives a, a similarity of performance. Here we go. Similarity of performance that minimizes the risk of error. And this is an output from one of our clients. And basically, here was an approach where if used about three quarters of the time, I would miss by over one and a half percent as compared to this over here, where only 5% of the time would have had that miss. So therefore, I have much more confidence, of course, that when I see a 3% difference in test and control in this methodology, I have much better capability of making a decision than if I don't. Now, this rubber hits the road in this example. And I'm going through it right now. Boy, I'd love to have advice from any of you here um, about a situation I'm in. Uh, we have a client, very big company, looking at a $2 billion investment. And they've employed a consulting firm, a terrific firm. And this firm has developed a test design. They've got it in market. They're now using it for analysis. And unfortunately, this test design is highly error prone. As a matter of fact, there is a two thirds probability of misread and the reporting a lift that is above hurdle. And what I now have to go back to my client 
to do and with the consulting firm is help them understand that actually that's about a $2 billion mistake. So again, this is a kind of analysis where tiny differences in tolerance can make very big differences in outcomes, and it's really important that we get them right. Um, briefly on test analysis, again, we can look at all kinds of different tests and talk about all kinds of different stuff. So far, pretty interesting. We doing all right? Um, we have basically three ambitions when we run a test. We want to understand what will happen if we take this idea and roll it out. What will the impact be on the key performance metrics that I care about most? Revenue, profit, customer satisfaction, competitive position, whatever. What will happen if I take this idea and I put it out across my entire customer base? I put it out across all my markets and so forth. And then secondly and thirdly, can I understand the idea at a sufficient level of detail um, so that I can understand, if it's that kind of idea, which variation works best? Can I tailor it for superior performance? And also, to the extent that I want to, can I understand how it performs differentially by market, by customer, by branch, or whatever, so that I can target it? Overall impact, opportunities to tailor, opportunities to target. And as we said earlier, um, within financial services, wide variety of applications. I'm going to run through one quick example, and this is a customer engagement promotion. I've already got the customers, they already have my service, but what I want to do is build my relationship with them and get farther. Um, and as I've, I've listened to the, the presentations today, um, and, and what's interesting is that we are in FinTech really in a, in a, in a new world in so many ways. Um, in, in other ways, you know, there's a Broadway song called Everything That's Old Is New Again. And revenue minus cost equals profit, and one of the large revenue drivers is customers, and, uh, and engagement, and the interactions that we're having with our customer base you know, are, are pretty similar to the kinds of, of interactions that branch banks have and that other companies that deal with uh, B2C models uh, engage in, that is beyond just direct to customer, beyond a closed loop, if I sent you an email and I got an answer, there's a wide variety of other, uh, of other you know, activities that are being invested in to improve performance. And the one I'm going to draw on here, this is an example. That I'm not going to show you the analysis of this. This is a, uh, an engagement promotion run by PayPal in partnership with MasterCard back in 2014. And the idea was in one week leading into holiday, if a customer spent $50 on their payment device, that customer would get a $10 gift certificate. Now... I think it's obvious, and we'll talk about the, uh, if we can get there, the, uh, the, the quote-unquote profit equation here. What's going on? Obviously, $10 is a lot more than the income that the payment provider makes on a $50 transaction. But what you want to be able to do is break this down test versus control, and you'll see that, yes, I will get more transactions. Yes, I will expand my dollar per transaction. That's going to lead to higher sales. But, oh, by the way, when I'm giving away all this margin as compared to control, I'm going to have a significant drop in gross profit percentage, right? And the expectation, the expectation is customer engagement promotion is that for those two weeks during a campaign, I'm actually going to lose money. But the reason I'm doing it, of course, is that the world doesn't stop at the end of this two-week campaign. As a matter of fact, I'm heading into kind of the, the heat of the holiday season. And what I'm hoping is that if I get people to try this out December 8th or the 14th, then when holiday comes along, I will be back to full profitability, but I will have an expansion in transactions and dollars per transaction that floats the boat back up and ideally makes money. All right, so here we go. We've seen some of these principles in action. We're going to go to promotions. Uh, we've run all of the uh, simulations. We understand uh, how many customers and what kinds of customers. Please wait for a second. Here we go. And uh, our analysts come back and say, I need to have 40,000 40, uh 40,000 customers, and I want to make sure they're matched on age and household income. And what we're going to do here actually is, is try out two treatments. We're going to try out a $10 gift card, and we're also going to try out double points, okay? And so I got my customer list, and I sent an email off to the head of customer campaigns, said, here's your list. Please send 20,000 text messages uh, each um, to customers talking about double points for the cash card, and let's see what happens. Great. So off it goes, um, and now we're ready to analyze. We've figured out our, uh, there's, our there's my test customers, 
Um, I made these all myself. No, I did not make this one myself. Um, and there's my control group. I've got my control group methodology. It is going to make for each one of the customers, a group of customers just like it, um, and great. And here's our results. So here we've got test and control tracking along together for the month of November. I hit the promotion button uh, on December, uh, November 25th, activating a uh, promotion uh, period of you know, those, those two weeks in December. And of course, what I see, happily what I see, is a separation. Test is driving more revenue, more charges on my, on my payment device than control. Great. Now, of course, I'm losing money during that period. And my question here was, well, what's going to happen afterwards? And as a matter of fact, test did outpace control, again, on customer activation and payment. Um, but the problem was, when I do the math on that, overall, this was not paying back the cost. Um, so bad news, if I roll this out across my entire network, I am not going to get a favorable outcome. But using very heavy-duty analytics on a very large amount of data, I can understand that as a matter of fact, I had differential performance. And those customers that were getting the much less expensive double points deal were actually profitable, not bad. And the customers that were getting the $10 gift cards were actually not, not working out for me. So answer to question number one, what happens if I roll this out across the network? Not good. Answer to question number two, can I tailor it? Absolutely, as a matter of fact. If I focus this campaign on double points, I'm actually getting a lift. And now the question is, is that the same for everybody? Well, I can then look within my customer group and understand against a wide variety of attributes, are there correlations between difference in the attribute and difference in the outcome? Um, and what these analysts discovered what there were, there were a couple that were pretty important. First of all, um, in this particular case, customers with higher spend in the last six months were much more uh, liable to, uh, to pay off. And as a matter of fact, those that had the highest spend were well above break even. Um, and interestingly, those that uh, had acquired their accounts more recently, uh, again, compared to control, uh, were, were significantly better. So, you know, the happy news is that I now have got um, an idea here that works on a tailored basis. I can target it. And the net economics of this two weeks in December program went from a negative impact of 400,000 US dollars to a favorable impact of two and a half million, um, or about a $2.9 million improvement. So that's a quick evaluation or a quick example of how this can be done. But let me summarize and then we'll sit down and, uh, and have a little chat. Um, fundamentally, we've talked about three challenges to being able to employ this quote-unquote gold standard, gold standard decision-making methodology. The first is that underlying all of this real-world data is really noisy. This takes an awful lot of data and an awful lot of analysis to be able to overcome this very challenging signal-to-noise problem. Number two, uh, companies have to be organized around the, around the approach, and they have to be organized around it not only in a consistent way, but in a way that, that has credibility. Multiple approaches, multiple competing analyses, uh, not good for business. And then lastly, to go back to our issue that we had with Bill in the Philippines, business decisions move on their own pace, and they will not wait for, uh, they will not wait for the analysis to come through oftentimes uh, by, by just net necessity. Um, so to address those three, um, we've talked about these first. It is really important to have scientific test design principles in your areas of capability, number one. Number two, oftentimes uh, an idea, and we've measured, we've talked to our clients about this, typically about 40% of, of all ideas don't work. They don't come through this process favorably. Unfortunately, we never know when we get started which ones are good or which ones are bad. And it's helpful to have a philosophy like Thomas Edison said, which is, I've discovered 980 ways not to make a light bulb. Um, but sometimes, uh, a, an idea that doesn't work uh, at the top line works very powerfully if I can understand how to segment. And lastly, maybe we'll talk about this in Q&A. Um, getting here requires um, a mastery of big data, of integrated data of multiple sources, both metrics and attributes. So with that, quick introduction to uh, test and learn in the physical channels. Uh, David, shall we sit down? i be on time. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Please give a big round of applause for the moderator for the Fireside Chat, the head of innovation of Cinecron, Mr. David Horton.
Good. Is this working? Yeah, great. Well, thanks for that speech, Scott. Uh, it's fascinating to see um, how you can take a, a subject around testing and really give it um, you know, an, another angle that uh, people could talk about. One of the questions I've got for you is, if you, if you look at banking today, it really is um, at, a, at an inflection point. It's changing, right? Um, you know, in the old days, if you wanted to really test how well your service was to your customers, you might do some mystery shopping, you might send people to your branches. But increasingly now, it's becoming uh, much more of a digital business. What advice would you give to um, banks who are trying to change, who are trying to transform, attract the new millennial type of customer? Um, how, the, how should they go about that's a, uh, testing for this? Uh, a, a, that's a, that is a universal challenge. Uh, attracting and, and keeping a millennial um, seems to be seems to be a global goal, um, uh, and there are a number of different approaches that are being used. Of course, if, do we have the term here? Henry's high earning, not rich yet. Um, that's a very the 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 ambition to attract the Henry's out of that millennial population is a big deal among the financial community. Uh, no question about it. Uh, the the digitization of financial services is changing the channels. It's changing the means by which we uh, we contact our customers and prospects. It's changing in many respects the products, but it doesn't change revenue minus cost equals profit. And we're seeing companies, you know, uh, Wealthfront is one out of Silicon Valley that. Uh, is basically a wealth management firm for millennials. Um, it's got a very unique set of products. Um, it's got a unique way of interacting with the clientele. Um, but within that, uh, the issues around how should the product be tailored, around which customer contact points work and which ones don't, all of these are testable uh, and important um, uh, you know, um, challenges that really don't change in the digital world writ large than they, than they were in the, in the more traditional brick and mortar world. Sure. Um, so one of the questions that, that's come up from the audience and, and really resonated with me as well was if you look at a lot of uh, banks, there's always going to be people who have a vested interest in the results, right? How do you go about ensuring that uh, test cases are done so that yep. personal opinion or experience or gut feel yep. are kind of uh, uh, left out of the decision-making yeah. process? Well, it's, it's almost impossible to completely take out of the equation the impact that the results of an idea might have on various constituencies at an institution. Um, and it, I, I heard the last group talking about um, the importance of having a decision-making philosophy um, within, inside of a company that can tolerate that, that, uh, that kind of competition. Oftentimes, we've seen uh, financial institutions succeed by having this particular technique centered uh, in a CFO's office. Um, the CFO is oftentimes the, this kind of the scorekeeper. Um, and you know, what we don't see is it's not only the marketing team versus the, uh, the manufacturing team or whatever. Uh, as best as possible, uh, they can both be respected for the quality of their analysis and also bring the lowest amount of bias to the, to the, uh, uh, to the dissemination of results. Yeah. So. Now, one thing that occurred to me when I was uh, watching your presentation is there is a difference uh, when it comes to the culture and the language. Um, how would you say uh, you could kind of transcend that when it comes to looking at different regions? So a lot of what you've described, I can understand how that might work in the US with the, uh, you know, the availability of data. Yep. What would you say is um, uh, you know, the, the factors that might influence this part of the world? Yep. So I think that... Um uh, the data infrastructure and the evolution of data infrastructure is really pretty interesting. Um, uh, certainly, the quote-unquote Western economies have had a lead. I'd say in East Asia, there are certain countries that have fully caught up, and we're in one of them right now. Singapore has done a magnificent job in building out the data infrastructure here. Um, uh, it's, it's only a matter of time and rubbing the problem with money that will catch up. I, I certainly think that both the biggest and farthest behind uh, on average day is China, um, but I fully expect that they'll be fully caught up um, in, in a very small amount of time. And we saw this evolution in the USA 20 years ago um, when that full data infrastructure was still in development where the data infrastructure has to come first and then the decision culture that goes on top of it. Um, I'm very optimistic that, that uh, uh, this entire region will be up and running fully within the next three or four years. 
Great. Um, so the one area that I, I hear a lot about, and I, I hear this from our clients, particularly for this, this region, is the growing trend towards wealth management. Um, there's obviously a huge influx of money into the region, and the high net worth individual ratio is increasing all the time. Um, what are the sort of things that you would recommend banks look at when, um, when trying to test around how do they acquire new customers in that segment? Uh, how do they keep them to lower the attrition rates? Uh, you know, generally improve the way that they, yeah. they service their customers. Um, I should start by saying I'm not an expert in wealth management and building a wealth management company. And so uh, I, I, I can certainly tell you that I know what the levers are, and we've talked about them, um, but it's very hard to know, not only in general within wealth management in Asia for high income individuals, but also specifically given the various competitive positions that each one of each, each player might have in the industry, which ones work for them. Um, what works best is an environment in which hypotheses can be brought forward. Uh, they can be prioritized in as low of a, in as unbiased a way as possible, to your point earlier, and they can get in a market quickly. Um, the successful financial services companies that are running processes like this are running hundreds of tests a year. So it's not, it's, it's actually not that, you know, overwhelming a process. Um, and some of them are on issues where you never get the right answer. It's only a matter of continuing to grind and grind and get better at it. Um, and certainly, customer acquisition, customer uh, expansion and retention are, are you know, um, uh, those, are those, those kinds of challenges that, that work against that kind of grinding of the stone. Sure, sure. Um, you, you touched upon it a little earlier in your discussion when you were saying, uh, you know, there's, there's regions like uh, Singapore, Dubai, who are aspiring to s sort of take the lead in the fintech. Yep. What do you think uh, is the reason for that? And, and, and what are the sort of factors that are helping them to actually leapfrog uh, other parts of the world who traditionally were the leaders in those spaces? Well, I, I'm well aware of the ambition in Singapore and, and think that the ambition is a really good start. Just having a focus on becoming an analytical leader um, in, in fintech and in other areas uh, uh, is its own reward. Um, and the investments that the, the, you know, the kingdom has been making here, the countries are making, have, have been very impressive. Um, it's, in, it, it's not clear to me what will be the criteria that will lead to success because many of the competitive barriers are very low. You know, data storage, no competitive barriers. Uh, software analytics, um, you can absolutely attract good scientists who can build good software. Um, but, you know, it's a big round world and there are a lot of good ones. There are certain, I think, on the other hand, um, assets that Singapore has that are really special. For example, and this is outside of FinTech, we talked about this backstage, uh, Singapore has got an electronic medical record of all of its citizens, and that's an incredible asset. There's no other country in the world except maybe Iceland that has that. And that could be the basis of attracting scientists from all over the world to Singapore to run you know, medical research uh, using high-powered statistical software um, and build an employment base and also a very uh, high-ticket set of uh, knowledge set. Um, so, you know, I think that beyond the sort of infrastructure investment, understanding how that investment will pay off uh, is a challenge that's yet to be entirely resolved in my, in my opinion. Yeah, okay. So I've got a question here from the audience, which is seem, seems to be getting more and more votes. Um, so I'm gonna ask that. If given enough time, one can find correlation to prove one's case. How do we ensure that the ethical variables and models are chosen for modeling? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll talk, start with the first part, um, because I really, I really do believe that, that, uh, that given enough data and given enough time, uh, we can oftentimes find correlations that are not causal. We can find relationships between variables that actually are not descriptive of the mechanism of change. Um, and as big data becomes even bigger, you have more and more data to be able to analyze both through uh, increasingly powerful um, you know, uh, processing as well as increasingly efficient storage capacity, um, it will become a, a much bigger challenge, I think, for we human beings to be able to sort through the correlations and understand which ones are truly related to causality and which ones are simply correlates. Um, 
testing can be one way you can sort through that. Uh, I find, you know, machine learning, which is in some respects uh, a description of what you're talking about here, to provide fantastic, unbelievable hypotheses. Um, but it is important that they be quantified or corroborated through the scientific method, in my opinion. Sure. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a subject that leads me to, uh, to a, a, a topic that's, that's well known throughout the industry now, which is this apparent lack of good data scientists. Um, and, you know, whoever you speak to, you get a different definition of what a data scientist is. Some think it's a technical person. Yeah. Another believe it's, a, it's an SME domain expert in that space. Yep. What does it mean to you? What, what would you say are the, the, the key <laughs> attributes of a good data I know. scientist? Um, first of all, I'll tell you, it is, it is uh, when we talk about differences between East Asia and the Western economies today, that's a big one. There is uh, pound for pound fewer data analysts here in East Asia than there are in the, in, in the USA and Western Europe. Um, and whether or not that's just a matter of education and the, uh, the college systems being able to, you know, provide the, the training that's required uh, or whatever, I don't know. Um, but it would be what I would put my son into here, uh, who's now going to law school, by the way, in the USA, um, if, we, <laughs> if we lived here. Um, I wish he went into it actually in the USA too. Um, typically, I think, you know, a good data analyst is somebody who can understand data, understand math, and be able to relate the two to get the answers. Um, and a simple sum. Okay. So I've got another question here from the audience. Um, how can big data be able to provide data privacy assurance and address things like the risk of an evolving cyber threat or a big targeted board? Um, talking about the first piece, I think that uh, data security is a very important issue <laughs> and, and uh, um, it's getting... Uh, it's getting uh, obviously more concerning every day. Um, I don't know how big data can help that um, uh, because in some respects it is the tapping into a big data that is sort of raising the, raising the, uh, uh, the importance of the issue. Um, your second was about cybersecurity? Yeah. Yep. How can it address the risk of an involving cybersecurity threat? So essentially... Um, how, how, how do you do testing quickly enough and more efficiently so that you can, you can actually react to something like a cybersecurity threat that is changing just as quickly? Uh, I don't know. That, I, I don't know how testing per se helps that. I think that there's a wide variety of different security protocols and it is this race of the accelerator versus the brake um, in terms of both the threat and the tools that we're using to fight the threat um, that... that, that appears to be ongoing for quite some time and, and goes beyond commercial but also into geopolitical. Sure. So I guess one of my, um, my final questions really is if you had to give some advice to a bank today who's looking to really take their testing methodology and, and build a framework that's scalable and sizable, mm -hmm. what would be the, the, the sort of main key points that you, you think that yep. they should consider? Well, I think that there are four, four dimensions. There, in no particular order, people and you talk about having both the analytical bench as well as, I think, the decision-making openness to the process. Process, and we talked a little bit about that in my comments about process of both prioritizing test ideas and also you know, design, implementation, and, uh, and management. Um, the third is data. Uh, and typically, uh, to run good tests, you want to have both a very comprehensive uh, sort of time series metric set of fundamentally every transaction that you've done, as well as a wide variety of, uh, of attribute data or descriptive data of every customer, every market, competition, and so forth. Um, and then the fourth is tools. Um, we talked a little bit about the software tools we've built. There's a wide variety that can be applied, but it's basically mastering those four dimensions that can bring this very powerful process to, to great fruition inside of a financial services company. Sorry, I, ha I, I have one, one last question. Don't apologize. Can you tell us a little bit about your roadmap? Um, obviously, there's more and more advancement in AI. We're starting to see things like machine learning, cognitive sciences, neural yep. networks. H how do you see the sort of future footprint of your solutions and mm -hmm. how are they evolving? Um, I can't tell you everything. <laughs> but, but everything you've just described is a part of what we're working on. Um, and uh, we've got much better 
scientists than I am on the project, but I've challenged them with, for example, uh, a world in which you can walk up to a machine and say, I'd like to test a new price on loans. And uh, basically home equity loans uh, and let's push pricing up. Um, and that through just that statement to the machine, the test can be designed, it can be put in a market and can be automatically read coming back. Um, I, don't, I don't see why if we had a world with driverless cars um, uh, and, and AI in so many different ways, that can't be in the future. Um, there, there seems to me to be the possibility of ongoing testing at a very, you know, kind of molecular level um, to be able to understand not just gross ideas, but also continuously improve the wide variety of just tiny decisions that today are uneconomically, are une uh, pardon me, uneconomical to put through a grandiose testing process. Um, there's no doubt that multi-entities uh, continue to be critical, and that's a very important part of our uh, our roadmap between different channels, um, different touch points, different media, and so forth. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, I think that, that what we'll have to be able to do is provide customer privacy. And we don't take any personal identifiable information, for example, but, but within this process, both have customer privacy and also customer relevant outputs. Um, and that's taking a lot of our development time too. Okay. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.